So uh, good morning. I'm going to whistle through the introduction. For those regulars, you'll know that this is our fourth instalment to a series of webinars from the two Steves. Um, and the main intention here is to really help our clients um, who have every intention to go green in their work, but they don't always know where to start. So with the introductions, my name is Radhika Devisha and I'm a senior associate at Sharp Pritchard and a lot of my matters um, do have focus on climate change being a key consideration. So I'm fortunate enough to be a chair to this Green Steve's webinar um, series and um, I look forward to discussing your specific queries and battery storage once we've heard from our speakers today. So. And to the intros for the speakers, we have uh, the regulars, Steve Gummer, who is our lead partner on climate change um, and energy for Shop Pritchard, and Steve Sorrell of Stephen Sorrell Consultancy Limited. And uh, Steve is a leading consultant on climate change, low carbon and renewable energy for local authorities. So the main purpose of today, it's really to highlight um, areas in the energy market that can be taken advantage of and we're doing this in a way that can be covered both from the legal and consultancy angles and um, also sharing best practice. So the paper to be discussed today is on battery storage. It was published on the 13th of October so those of you um, that haven't had a chance to read it we'll be covering the topic in a bit more detail and for those that haven't quite had the chance yet it's available on Sharp Pritchard's website on the Green Steve's page so please do have a read. Um, the right to ensure um, as you as per usual to ensure that we hear from all perspectives we've uh, but lucky enough to be joined by guest speakers today, and that is Ben Wallace and um, Ashley Boyce of AMP Clean Energy. So just a bit about um, our guests. Ben has been developing low carbon energy schemes for over 15 years, working in house and as a consultant and has extensive industry knowledge covering um, natural gas generation, wind, solar, nuclear and biomass power projects as well. Um, Ashley similarly has had um, uh, a, a successful um, experience in uh, flexible energy generation projects across the UK, including distributed gas peaking plants and larger energy storage projects. So most recently, Ben and Ashley are working together on um, their business called Battery Box. And so we, we look forward to hearing more about that later. So the running order for today is uh, first I'll be passing um, on to Steve Sorrell to explain battery storage from the consultancy perspective. Then moving on to Steve um, to uh, highlight some of the key legal issues and then on to Ben and Ashley Boyce. Um, I'd also I, I, earlier today, I, I, yeah, I think, think it's still the case. I just want to highlight that Steve Gummer is actually using Francesca Gallagher's um, PC today just with IT issues so please don't get put off that will be Steve Gummer speaking um <laughs> don't be fooled by the um by the uh name uh right so over to Steve Sorrell thank you lovely thank you very much uh Radhika, and uh, welcome everybody um as you've heard this is the fourth of our installments of uh, webinars for for local authorities in relation to aspects of the green agenda and we're we're looking at uh, battery storage today as has been said um and i hope you've had a chance to have a look at the paper that came out there's a bit more detail in that as usual um and we're just going to briefly um cover some of the areas in the the uh, the few talks but you can raise any question you like or a comment uh, as you wish um, at the end in the interactive session. OK, let's start with a bit of background then. As we all know, um, the UK is in the middle of an energy crisis, partly caused by the war in Ukraine, but rapidly rising wholesale gas prices causing um, quite a bit of alarm. And that's prompted the government to feel it necessary to intervene. And we now have the energy bill with the energy price guarantee for consumers and the energy bill relief scheme for business as two examples of the package of measures that have been brought out to try and deal with that. But the need has never been greater for more renewable energy, offering energy security to the UK, but also lower prices for consumers. But the problem is that most renewable energy is intermittent in nature. It's not always the case. Deep geothermal is a good example of where you can find base load, but um, wind and solar particularly are intermittent in nature. And this means that balancing the grid is infinitely more difficult than it would have been when there was a smaller number of very large coal-fired power stations providing that um, power. 
but energy storage provides a neat solution to get around this problem. So if I could move on to the next slide then, please. The principle of battery storage is very simple. I normally use the example here of, of uh, my house in Leeds, which has 20 solar panels in the um, in the garden, that's five kilowatts, and a, a, a Tesla Powerwall 2 battery in the garage. And on a day like today, when it's daylight and sunny, the, the panels are generating electricity, which charges up the battery. And as soon as it gets dark and there's no more solar energy, the battery keeps the lights on in the house in the evening. So you're largely self-sufficient during um, uh, certainly the summer and, and autumn and, and spring um, as well. But battery storage works at any level. And so a large solar farm, which is our example today, can also have battery storage and sell the electricity at peak hours for a better margin. And all of my comments are based around lithium ion batteries. I know there's lots of different types and more being developed all the time, but um, the, the, the majority of the market is actually lithium ion in nature. So if we move on to the next slide then, please. Solar farm developments, well, there's no actual list of all of them, but we know there's at least 20, possibly a few more, owned and operated solar farms in the country. I've worked on quite a few of those myself. The first three I worked on in uh, Cornwall Council, Telford and Rekin and uh, Wrexham, and they've been followed by a number of others now. All the early ones, of course, wouldn't have had battery storage. They were just um, a, a standard standalone solar farm. But more to the point, there's a huge pipeline of solar farm projects waiting to come forward. So there was a very interesting article published in Solar Power Portal last week, and that estimated the capacity of local authority solar farms in that pipeline to be in the region of 500 megawatts. Now, I, I was actually quite surprised at that. But um, Solar Media, who produced that journal, uh, have done a review of all planning applications. Um, and that is the sum total of applications in by local authorities for solar farm projects. So they might all, not all go forwards, but there's a huge pipeline of projects. We covered solar PV in a, a previous paper and webinar, but essentially you've got a two year project. It's a capital investment. The council finds the site, obtains planning consent, gets a grid connection and procures an EPC contractor to build and operate the, the asset. And a really good example has just been completed, which is the third large solar farm from Warrington Borough Council, this time in Sirencester, that's been built for it by GridServe. It's 23 megawatts in capacity and has 43,000 bifacial tracker solar panels. Um, and that's uh, literally just, just come online in the last few weeks. The difference on this particular example of the solar farm in Sirencester, though, is that it also has 51 megawatts of battery storage added into the mix. So if we could just move on to the next slide then, please. So uh, when I talked about battery storage above, I gave you a domestic example of the, the solar panels in the day and the battery keeping the lights on in the house in the evening. It's a bit different um, with a solar farm as there's no use on site. Um, so the benefit of uh, battery storage is essentially to the business case, i.e. the income generated by the asset. Usually the business case would be developed at a very early stage in the project. Um, and if battery storage is to be added, then an additional capital cost will appertain, of course, because you have to purchase the batteries as well as the equipment um, in relation to the uh, the solar um, itself. Um, so effectively, you have to then project the income to, to ensure that the business case would show that there is additional income from the addition of the battery storage. Now, the income in any project is called the income stack, and it may have a number of different elements in relation to it, depending on which way the developer has decided to go. And in the report, I mentioned three examples. One was frequency control, where there's a contract to, uh, for battery assets to add capacity or take capacity from the grid at any particular stage. Another example was the capacity market, which is one of the government's mechanisms under electricity market reform, um, where you are paid to guarantee security of electricity supply in the future and to ensure that there's investment in renewables. And then there's just plain old electricity trading or arbitrage, where you effectively charge up when the electricity prices are low and discharge into the grid when they're much higher and make a profit on that transaction. 
but you can't do all of those. So your your strategy has to decide which way you want to go, although there normally will be more than one element in the income stack um, for um, a project. If I can move on to the next slide then. Of course, this is a slightly different position. We're going to hear a bit more about this uh, later on. A standalone battery asset is where you don't have a solar farm. Um, effectively, you just have the, it's a battery farm, I suppose you'd, you'd describe it, isn't it? Um, because the battery exists uh, on its own. Um, an example would be one and a half acres of land, 50 megawatt battery installation to engage in electricity trading. It's run in a very similar way to the solar farm. In actual fact, the local authority would need land. It would need a um, planning consent. It would need a suitable grid connection and it would need um, an EPC contractor um, uh, to build it. But effectively, there's no energy, um, renewable energy in the mix. Um, there's just this trading of the electricity and the argument if you say well why do we why do we have that without the renewables the argument of course is that the UK will not reach the position of net zero carbon under the Climate Change Act um, 2008 unless a huge amount more of battery storage is actually provided and there is a good example from local government which I've set out in the paper and that South Somerset District Council which developed a standalone battery farm of 25 megawatts in 2020 costing 12.5 million pounds and that's been very successful and the council is now expanding its investment in other battery assets. If I can move on to the next slide just on the business case front, um, we're modelling in all the projects I'm working on at the moment, we're modelling solar PV at around £600, £650 pounds a kilowatt installed, which is £600, 600 to £650,000 pounds a megawatt installed. And lithium ion storage effectively has a very similar cost curve to solar. And so currently being modelled about five fifty to £600,000 a megawatt installed. So essentially, if you have um, battery storage with your solar farm, you're doubling the capital cost by do so doing. How does it work then? Practical issues um, on a solar farm, battery storage is normally by way of shipping containers. A 40 foot shipping container will contain between one and two megawatts of battery storage. Of course, a solar farm already has infrastructure of this nature because we have um, uh, uh, we have a container with the uh, switch gear and the the inverter and other equipment in it. So you would just add to the number of that. All sorts of ready made containers are available. You can actually get them with the cells in now um, or you can just get the, um, the container, which is fireproof and has other uh, protections on it and fit the cells to it. Another important practical issue, which is um, sometimes overlooked, is that, of course, if you have a solar farm, then you apply for a grid connection. That grid connection is an export connection. So you can export the amount of electricity you've generated from your solar panels into the grid. If you have battery storage, you must have an import connection at the same time. And the whole idea being, of course, that you may be taking a massive amount of electricity out of the grid to charge up your batteries. Um, and then the export connection puts it back into the grid. And sometimes this causes problems with the DNO. Um, so that, that's all part of the, the, the grid aspect. Batteries last for 10 years. So a business case for longer than that, as they normally are, would see the battery cells being replaced in um, year 11. So after the 10 years, you replace the cells. And if you have these containers, you just take out the cells, all the other infrastructure stays in place. Um, and that's actually sorted out. On to the next slide then. Examples from local government. I've mentioned Warrington and its developments in York, East Riding and most recently Sirencester. For standalone battery assets, the best example is South Somerset District Council, as I've mentioned. But do remember that you can add battery storage to any solar farm after the event. It doesn't have to be done at the same time. Um, essentially, all the ones that have already been built could add battery storage if they wanted to. Um, but um, where you're designing a new solar farm, you should always design it with um, battery storage in case you want that opportunity for the future. And then it's included on the plans and in the plan consent. A few conclusions then. It's estimated there are 32 gigawatts of battery storage now in the pipeline. So that's 32,000 megawatts 
of battery storage projects already in that pipeline. That means planning or applying for grid or at some uh, point on the scale of developing a project. But between 50 and 100 gigawatts is required. So there's a long way further to go. Local authorities have come to this slowly. And I just wonder whether we're going to get the same thing as we had in relation to solar PV. They saw the opportunity for solar farms, didn't really take the opportunities until the private sector had largely cleaned up and made millions out of developing solar farm assets. So here we are again, um, like Groundhog Day, battery storage is a similar opportunity. Let's hope that we don't oversee this one because uh, there was never a time when this was needed more. Thank you very much. Oh, brilliant, Steve. Thank you so much for that. And it really has given um, our clients an idea of how they could possibly use battery storage. Um, but now over to Steve Gummer to talk about legal considerations. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Radhika. Um, so I'm going to spend spend the next sort of 10, 15 minutes talking about sort of some of the more detailed legal considerations. Um, and perhaps some of this will sort of provide some of an answer to why some people are in the short term kind of deterred from delivering battery storage projects, because there is some there is some potential complexity. Um, that being said, a frequent refrain of Stephen Mines is that all of these things have been done before. So no matter how complex it may seem, um, these things have been done and there is a tried and tested route for doing it. So I would pick up on the point Steve made, which is that now is the time to do this if you're pondering doing it. Um, first of all, I just wanted to allude to something Steve said, which is, and Steve Steve spoke about sort of lithium ion, ion batteries. They're a good example of chemical batteries, but there are a lot of other battery types out there and it's just worth dwelling on that for a second. So you might have a flow battery, that's a type of rechargeable battery. Um, where solution is passed over a membrane. Um, you might have pumped storage hydroelectricity. That's exactly what it sounds like and is quite a complex idea of a battery, but is actually, again, quite prevalent. So effectively, at times of high generation um, or low demand on the grid, um, generation capacity is effectively used to pump water to an elevated reservoir pool. Um, then when more electricity is needed on the grid, um, that pool may be released and that turns a turbine releasing electricity. Um, and there are some good examples of those, I think, in particular in North Wales. Um, then things like compressed air batteries, again, a similar idea to the to the hydro, but with um, sorry to the pump, but with but with compressed air, i.e. effectively excess generations used to compress ambient air. Um, it's normally done in underground caverns. Um, then when electrical power is needed, the pressurized air, air is heated and expanded, turns a turbine. Um, thermal energy storage, again, quite commonly used, um, can be used with a range of technologies, um, but effectively allowing temporary storage of energy in the form of heat or cold air, for example, solar thermal power, that can be used um, to sort of um, in, in peak sunlight hours to heat sort of molten salt, and then the excess heat can then be used to generate steam to turn turbine. Um, gravitational sim similarly, and now we're seeing this rise of hydrogen gas batteries too, um, as, as sort of the hydrogen revolution begins. Um, so so just to say that there is there is effectively a range of, of battery technology. So when we are talking about batteries, we are not talking about any one thing. There is a range of technology. And actually the legal issues that arise in respect of your battery kind of depend on which technology you use. And we'll come on to that again in, in a sec. Um, Steve touched a bit about why a bit about why energy storage is important. Um, it's not quite the 5th of November yet, but I thought it was important to remember, remember the 9th of August 2019 or blackout day. Um, this was the day on which the UK and in particular London was impacted by a national blackout. Um, over one million customers lost power, National Grid and Ofgem did an investigation. And what effectively happened was that there was a disruption um, um, largely based on thunder and lightning. Um, and the grid lost Hornsey Wind Farm, which was responsible for outputting about 700 megawatts. It also lost Little Barford Combined Cycle Gas Turbine, and it also lost about 500 megawatts of sort of small distribution connected to the generation. 
Um, so it lost all of it lost all of that in one go, um, which was about three percent of system demand um, due to lightning and a tripping of the high voltage transmission line. Um, what that goes to show is one we need we need this energy storage because what we needed in that moment was an a, a sort of quick frequency response. Um, it also goes to show that the challenge isn't purely just intermittency as we get so as climate change causes kind of uh, more extreme weather conditions. Actually, we have events that can actually impact the transmission, the transmission network itself, affecting all embedded technologies um, with the result that we need frequency response. We'd need these things that can quickly turn on to save our to save our grid. Um, the other reasons there for why care about energy storage. Yes, obviously um, there is change in demand um, now that we we are we are calling on the grid more and more for electricity. Um, our patterns of usage have changed. Uh, more of us are staying at home, for example. Um, it used to be the it used to be the case that the peak time for the electricity grid was when everyone turned on their cattle in the middle of Corrie at half past seven. Um, that's no longer true as we move to watching Netflix and things like that. Um, there are more demand, uh, sorry, supply side technologies now. So, for example, many of us have got things like washing machines that you can program to turn on when the grid is is operating at um, is operating at lowest cost. But effectively, there are there are sort of the, the widely understood patterns of usage of electricity in the system aren't holding true. There is also just a general increasing requirement for electricity as we sort of electrify transport, EV, which Steve and I have spoken about in other seminars. Of course, decarbonisation, Steve's already touched on this really well. A lot of a lot of renewable tech, wind, solar is rather intermittent. The sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow. Um, and the risk is that effectively, what you need is sort of battery storage and energy storage, which smooths out those those peaks and troughs in 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 generation. Lastly, security of supply. Um, at the moment, obviously, there's a huge there's a huge focus on security of supply, particularly with oil and gas prices being impacted by things like the war in Ukraine. Um, but what but what you note is that a lot of the capacity market, a lot of the frequency response that isn't battery storage is actually um, those gas and coal fired power stations, which are effectively the types of tech that are very, very good at turning on very, very fast. Unfortunately, they are the ones particularly uh, imp adversely impacted by price increases. So they are very expensive to turn on. They're also not particularly environmentally clean. Um, then lastly, just one, one quick point about electricity networks themselves are, are undergoing change. Um, generation sort of increasingly two way. Um, Steve spoke about his electric vehicle um, and he spoke about grid connections increasingly being two way. So the very nature of our grid is changing and our DN and the way our DNOs interact and all of that is creating this opportunity for energy storage. Um, I'm going to do a very, very boring bit of background. Now, this, I think, is the point at which most electricity, uh, most local authorities that I've spoken to kind of lose a bit of interest in battery storage. There's no need to, but it is important to have a bit of background about how the wholesale electricity market works before you dive into battery storage. So if I talk about what I'm talking about here is how electricity in Great Britain is traded. This So this is a kind of tripartite arrangement. Generators and others sell to electricity suppliers, so your EDFs, your EONs, who then sell to consumers, people like you and me and Sharp Richard of Business. So when we talk about trading, what I'm actually talking about today is the wholesale market, i.e. sales from generators and others to suppliers. So electricity trading occurs both in long and short term time frames. So some, some suppliers will buy years in advance. Um, and, so, and some will do on the day deals effectively to cover the shortfall because suppliers have to forecast then the needs from their customers. Contracts can be over the counter or they can be um, so effectively kind of bilateral. So an agreement between a wind farm and EDF, for example, um, or they can be done on a power exchange. Um, alongside the market sits balancing mechanism and that's run by the ESO, the, electric, um, the electricity system operator at the moment, National Grid. Um, 
effectively electricity is tra traded in real time. It's not like any other commodity. What does that mean? It means the, the demand and supply on the electricity must always be balanced. There must always be enough generation to meet demand. Now, there's huge detail behind this. Effectively, what happens is this is done in 30 minute settlement units. Um, and there is also something called gate closure, which occurs the hour before each settlement unit. And then the balancing mechanism kicks in. So this is the mechanism under which national grid matches supply with demand. Every generator and supplier has to notify what they're going to put on the grid. And then national grid does the job of balancing things up. It does this by a series of bids and offers. Um, so effectively a bid is, uh, sorry, an offer price is the price that you indicate if you want to be paid per megawatt to increase generation or decrease demand. And conversely, a bid is the price you're willing to pay per megawatt to decrease in generation or increase in demand. Um, then what National Grid does is it settles up afterwards. So if you've used more electricity than you contracted for and you have to, as a supplier, then you have to buy more electricity and, th and there's a system sell, uh, buy price for that. If you've, if you've taken more electricity from the grid as a supplier, you have to buy more electricity again, that's the system sell price. Um, so that sounds, it sounds hugely daunting and, and it's done through a series of kind of intimidating looking contracts and balancing mechanisms, but it, it's going to underscore um, why the need for battery storage, which is which is what I'll come on to now. Um, so, as with as with any major infrastructure project, before you set it up, what you need to do is justify your investment. You're going to spend a million pounds on a battery. You need to know you need to know what's the point. Why am I going to do that? How's it going to pay for the capital investment? So, if you're investing in major battery storage. Um, there are several means by which you can kind of recoup your capital investment. And this is going to explain a little bit why, why I, I did the background I just did. Um, so that perhaps one of the simplest means, there are two really simple means here, co-location and land rental, and then there are two more complex ones. So co-location is what Steve just spent quite a lot of time talking about. This is a core use for local authorities, and it's quite attractive to developers of generation projects because what it does is it allows the ability to store electricity that can into that can sort of mitigate one of your disadvantages of things like solar and wind, i.e. they're intermittent. Um, absent storage, what the unpredictability means is that revenues from generation, including levels of payment, network charges, all of those things, they can't be maximized. You can't sell at the perfect time you'd like. You can't buy at the perfect time you'd like. In contrast, if you fit energy storage to it, it gives you that flexibility to sell and buy and buy when you want. Um, just just taking the fourth of my bullet points perhaps first, because I'll, I'll deal with the easy ones first. There is an even easier version than sort of fitting your battery to to a to a produced generation project, and that's land rental. Um, Amp are going to, um, our colleagues from AMP are going to talk about that a bit more, but if you are a landowner, there are some third party providers who what they will do is they will pay you a regular rental fee. They will fit a battery on your land that will give you a rental payment and they will then take care of lots of the market facing bits that we've just been talking about. That might not perhaps lead you with leave you to maximize your opportunity, but what it does do is de-risk the opportunity for you and provide you with a regular revenue stream. The two more complex ways of creating revenue from your energy storage are grid services and price arbitrage, both of which Steve briefly touched on. So if I if I take the grid, grid services one by one, so the first is frequency response. So a brief background on what system frequency is. System frequency is nothing more complex than the balance between system demand and total generation. If demand's greater than generation, then frequency falls, while if generation's greater than demand, frequency rises. Um, National Grid, the ESO, they manage this in real time. Um, and back to, and what they do is they have, they issue frequency response contracts. So those are contracts with short term providers, quite often battery providers, who will be paid for availability, paid for capacity, so that when National Grid says, oh my goodness, I need some additional electricity, I need some additional generation on the grid, they know those battery storage providers are available. And there are minimum requirements for those contracts, things like duration and pace at which you can turn on. The nature in which National Grid's been doing this, the contracts they've been letting, which they do through procurement rounds, they've changed a bit. So in 2016, um, we had what was called enhanced frequency response, and there was a tender round for that. Um, 
we're now onto something new which started this year which is called dynamic containment um, again all of these terms kind of I think just serve to kind of put people off but effectively what is it it's effectively a contract with a battery storage operator or someone else to manage sudden frequency imbalances do you have electricity that you can turn on at short notice the slightly less short notice one is the capacity market again Steve touched on it so the capacity market for Great Britain um, effectively it provides certain regular payments to electricity capacity providers some of those could be battery storage um, again there's auction rounds um, companies which bid successfully at auction stage they sign what's called a capacity market agreement and they commit to provide electricity or reduce electricity consumption when required and they get regular payments for doing that these types of contracts they're kind of they're for existing projects they're generally about 15 years long I should say perhaps problematically the frequency response contracts I was talking about they tend to be somewhere between three and four years long and that does create a bit of a legal issue because actually your revenue stream isn't quite as long as your asset life which is a, a bit of a challenge I won't spend ages on SEG um, because we've talked about it a bit um, a bit before the system export guarantee but what it does is it allows people to sell export to the grid, which Steve's, Steve's sort of touched on. Very quickly on price arbitrage, which is what Steve was talking about with the Somerset project. Um, this is if you've just got a battery in a merchant scenario. It's quite common in the private sector. You have a battery, you have no generation asset. You set up your battery, it buys from the grid when prices are low, it exports to the grid when prices are high. So great example in the case of pump storage, the imported power is kind of used to physically pump your water up to the top of your reservoir and then at peak electricity demand um, the water is released that generates power which you sell to the grid when when prices are high so those are your, those are your revenue options there are quite a lot as steve said you can't you won't be able to maximize all you might be able to maximize you might be able to use a few of them um, are there problems in setting up in setting up these these energy storage projects there aren't problems there are there are some challenges and that's why it's really important brief plug to hire good educated legal advisors when you do it um the first is the first is licensing um this has been an historic problem which is if you look at the electricity Dra act as drafted you will not see a reference to storage um instead most storage and again it depends on what technology you're using but most storage counts as generation so you will need a license actually under the new energy bill which is before parliament at the moment critically not the energy prices bill but the energy bill um, that's going to clarify that storage does require its own separate license but you will need a license um, in order to in order to do most generation um, sorry most storage projects um, we've spoken a bit about revenue uncertainty already if you rely on frequency response your revenue contract is quite likely to be shorter than the life of your battery asset and that is a bit of a problem because it's okay for the first three four years but the question is where does my money come from after years four five and six um things that some some revenue streams are more reliable we've touched on the capacity market generally 15-year contracts and for some of the other projects that you're doing things like co-location actually you won't need a separate revenue contract for your battery storage what you'll need instead is a revenue contract for your um your generation asset and those tend to be a bit longer um, however, co-location comes with its own problems too, um, and that's and that's an issue of interaction with other regimes. Um, so, just briefly, um, we've advised a number of clients who have CFDs, contracts for difference, which we've touched on before, type of renewable subsidy for generation, and also have battery storage. Sometimes there are issues that arise. Um, so the CFD is designed to subsidize you for the moment. So the moment that you generate the, the electricity, what it is not designed to do is allow you to kind of up, do that price arbitrage. So generate, send to your battery, sell onto the grid when prices are at their best. Um, and so normally we've worked with a lot of clients who've who've effectively had to have this discussion with the LCCC, the CFD counterparty, to make sure that that's, that arrangement is sort of accommodated. That is being done more and more now, um, but initially it was, a bit of a, it was a bit of a challenge in some of the guidance it needed updating. Another brief problem relates to operating costs. So if you operate a battery and you buy when prices are high from the grid and you, 
uh, sorry, when buy when prices are low and sell when prices are high from the grid, there is a risk that you are going to incur normal electricity levies. So you are going to incur, for example, the renewables levies, the CFD type levies. You are also going to incur use of system charges. Now we've successfully managed with some projects to have discussions to try and avoid those arrangements but you need to be aware of that because otherwise you're adding huge amounts to the costs that you're that you're effectively paying there is an argument that says that you shouldn't pay those system costs those renewable costs for importing from the grid because you're not using the electricity what you're doing is using it to sell it back um, so that's that's a really important nuance and and depending on the project you sometimes get somewhere saying that shouldn't apply um, there are construction issues with battery storage, construction and installation issues. Steve's touched on planning. In extreme cases, very large battery projects can require an NSIP and a DCO. Otherwise, planning will normally be done under the Town and Country Planning Act. Um, perhaps one of the biggest issues is actually guarantees. Um, so what we find with a lot of installers is that you need comprehensive performance tests and guarantees. Um, they need to cover quite a range of things and actually we've worked with quite a lot of clients to structure the right way to frame those performance guarantees. So the duration that your battery can supply for, the ability for it to charge and how long that takes, the response time, the availability and as you will see all of those are critical to tying to your revenue contract because you will only get the revenue contract if your over duration and your response time is sufficient that it allows you to meet the qualifying criteria for things like frequency response um, there's a bit of a divide on our project about whether you put these things in the in the construction contract or in the O&M contract what we try to do is get the same contractor who does the construction to do the O&M and that way you join up the liability if you have a separate O&M contract you will very it will be very unlikely that you will get your O&M contractor to take all of the risk that you want for those those guarantees um, co-location just to say when you're when you're doing co-location so as Steve said you're building up you're building a big sort of rate on your solar farm for your battery you need to think about issues of installation and you need to think inter about interface between work that obviously might impact a single contractor doing a turnkey arrangement and um, there'll also be CDM type issues and managing the site type issues. Briefly software, i um, not going to embarrass myself by talking about data too much because I've got my colleagues who, who handled this but lots of batteries are dependent on the tech um, and there are some really important bits of that so do you have the relevant intellectual property rights do you have the relevant ownership rights and critically can those be assigned um, and what happens at the end of battery life um, where you assign the intellectual property rights which you might need to do important to make sure you assign them properly so that you've got an actual ownership right not an equitable right um, lastly specifications um, you probably need an output specification when you're designing a battery. Leave your technical expert to do the technical bit. You do a tech, you do an output spec with capacity, duration, etc. But there are relevant national grid codes that you should require conformance with, and industry experts will be able to help you with that. Final point on decommissioning. Um, whenever you set up renewables project, it's a good idea to think about what happens at the end and who is going to pay for it. Um, with batteries, there is a there is a slight nuance in that. Um, in that there are regulations which make some of these risks effectively the producer of the battery's risk. Um, that only happens for certain batteries and in certain scenarios, um, but there is something called the waste batteries and accumulators regulations, which means that people who produce batteries and are continuing to produce certain types of batteries have to take and effectively pick up the cost and, and sort of bother of, of decommissioning them. Um, so that was a very, very rapid run through of some of the issues we come across in the battery transactions we've done. Um, coming back to my three core points, one, don't be intimidated. Yes, there are a lot of issues, but all of those issues have been solved. There is nothing in here that has not been done already. Um, what's key is kind of making sure you've got the right advisory time to, team to help you, avoid the common fit, pitfalls. So as Steve said, don't get halfway through a project and then think about the grid connection or the planning. It's going to come with a cost. It's good to know it up front. Um, similarly, don't don't forget that you need or are likely to need some form of license under the Electricity Act. Um, the liability for not breaching that is criminal uh, for not complying with that is criminal, and it's important to get that right. Um, and then the last point is there are simpler and harder versions of this. So 
my amp colleagues are going to talk in a minute about sort of the rental type model you don't have to the most brutal is probably the price arbitrage where you buy when prices are low and sell when prices are high you don't have to do that model again the co-location model is quite simple and even simpler if you go behind the meter so effectively all you're really doing is supplying your own premises and making sure that your battery smooths out demand and supply not really exporting that much um, then there are the harder versions which are price arbitrage as i said and selling and buying and playing with the market so just because you don't want to do the most extreme version of battery storage doesn't mean you shouldn't look at battery storage and i'll stop there because i'm conscious of time Thanks, Steve. No, that was perfect. It was really, um, really informative. Um, please just a reminder, if you have any queries for either Steve, please put them in the chat feature. But now over to Ben Wallace and Ashley Boyce um, to talk about their project Battery Box. Thank you. Morning and thank you. And thank you to both Steve um, for inviting us to, to join us today. And it's great to, to see that local authorities are taking interest in energy storage, which is going to be a huge part of our journey to, to net zero. So that's, that's really encouraging. Um, just 20 seconds on, on who Amp Energy are. Um, we're, I always say we're sort of a medium-sized energy business where we're not, we're not quite an EDS or ivory scale yet, but we have 175 staff nationwide. We own 160 odd assets and assets range from um, biomass boilers and schools. We actually have a lot of local authorities as, as customers where we provide heat via biomass, which is supported by the government's renewable heat incentive. We have a number of other flexible energy projects around the country. Um, we also provide services to about a thousand clients. Um, so we have our own urban end business. We have people out in vans fixing fixing equipment and, and doing bits and pieces. But, but fundamentally, our business is about developing, funding, and operating um, a variety of, of small scale distributed energy projects. And increasingly, we are focusing on energy storage uh, as much as the industry are. Oh. The slide, please. So, you know, Steve, both Steve have talked about this, so I, I, won't, I won't dwell on it too, too long, but there are, there are effectively two problems that society is facing, and that's, that's Great Britain, that's Europe, and that's the world. And the first is the energy system is, is in transition. So we have a huge growth of demand for electricity over the next 25 to 30 years. And, and, and under all national grid scenarios for future energy, we have increasing demand. And that demand is driven by the electrification of heat. So, you know, removing gas boilers from houses is a big part of that, but using electricity for heat. The electrification of transport, and particularly the growth of electric vehicles. Um, I'm sure many of you will have electric vehicles now, but asked that five years ago, I suspect maybe, maybe none of you. And then also the growth of electrolyzers, which are um, is our plant which will produce hydrogen from electricity. So we can use hydrogen in both um, energy intensive industries, but also for potentially for heating. You put that against a backdrop of a huge closure program of the existing coal fleet in the UK. Almost all of it has already closed. There are a couple still still remaining, but will close shortly. We also have a, a legacy of old gas power stations built in the early 90s, which are all starting to come in towards the end of their life. And, and whilst coal and gas are high carbon emitters and something we need to move away from, what they are very good at is turning on and off when you need them. And what are we replacing that with? We're replacing that with low carbon generation. So predominantly wind, offshore wind is probably the, the largest chunk of that, but also onshore solar. Um, but they're locally dependent and they're weather dependent. So you, you have this shift, increase in demand and a change from technologies which are high carbon but very flexible to carbon technologies which are low carbon and inflexible. Slide, please. And where you get to is this, this graph is taken from the government's recent review of the electricity market review. So there's a full wide scale review of the electricity system already happening before the energy crisis we're facing. And what this graph shows you is in three years, 25, 35 and 2050. And it's the number of hours where either you have too much generation, so you have too much wind and you don't need as much electricity to be generated, or you don't have enough. And it, I think it's really important to say that there is a real shift. So by 2035, 50% of the time we will have more power than we need. But we also understand the other 50% of the time we will not have enough power. So what we need to do is work out how to move shift when we have too much to too little. And inevitably, energy storage is one of those solutions. 
Next slide, please. And the second problem, um, you know, I think we heard a little bit about is that networks are, are really no longer fit for purpose. You know, when the networks in the UK were built, they were built for big coal power stations, a transmission level to provide electricity down through the system, all the way down to your house and to your business. And it was a very singular flow. And what's happening now is that flow is being, being just you know, disrupted by lots of solar farms, other generators at lower levels of voltage. We've got electric vehicles, we've got heat pumps, batteries. The whole system is becoming far more complex. And you know, I, I picked up a quote from UK Power Networks, who run the electricity networks of East Anglia and the South East and London. And, and they expect that the decentralisation of energy to continue at lower voltage levels. And, and the, the change yet to come is going to be greater than we've seen at our high voltage levels. So managing the changes in the cables and substations in the streets and roads that we drive around is a, is a serious problem that we really have yet to address. So two problems, energy in transition, networks no longer fit for purpose. And of course, because we're here talking about how we, we're talking about the solution that we've come up with. So you can just move to the next slide for. And our solution is something we're calling a battery box. A battery box is a energy storage system, which is a 200 kilowatt capacity and a 400 kilowatt hour um, energy capacity. So you can charge your battery at 200 kilowatts for two hours, and then you can give back to the grid about 400 kilowatt hours over two hours. So the, the thing about this storage system, though, is it's you know, the Steve's have talked about big megawatt projects. This is very much at the small local level. So we are going to be help local vol low voltage systems. So you know, literally residential areas, small industrial areas, help manage the load that is changing through the change in technology. But also by building, and the, you know, our target for the first two or three years of this business is to build 500 of these, is that in aggregate, we can then also help shift large amounts of power. So we're solving both the transition issue and also the, the, the local network issues that people are facing. Uh, keep going, please. Go to the next slide. Thank you. So, so what do we need? So battery box is going to help fight climate change. It's going to help shift renewable energy from when it's abundant to when it's needed. It's going to help support energy security by getting rid of our, our reliance on imported fuels. I mean, the UK imports probably less than other parts of Europe, but we are still reliant on those fuels. And then the third benefit is that it's going to help local networks avoid power cuts and increase local capacity. Slide, please. Uh, John, I think I actually could, could go straight on. I've sort of done that once already. Right, so just, just give you an idea what a battery box looks like. So it's actually very small. It's about the size of one and a half car parking spaces to give you a, a sense of scale. And, and it will look not that similar to the substations and gas kiosks and telephone kiosks that you walk past every day of your life and almost never see, um, unless you're walking along with one of me or one of my team, you get very excited every time you see a substation. But it, it's effectively four and a half metres-ish by three metres-ish concrete plinth. Inside that, we're going to have a fence compound where you'll have two battery units. There's a picture of one there. It's, it's effectively looks not similar to a sort of a server ser you might have in your office. And then you have the green box, which is effectively a substation. It's a very small kiosk. Again, you can imagine you see those all over the place. And then we're going to put that into a fence compound. So a battery box in itself is a very small thing. We, we think you know, they, they will sit as street furniture all over the place. You'll, you'll eventually become used to seeing them and then they'll become almost invisible. Um, next slide, please. So I'm going to hand over to Ash and she'll explain about how, how local authorities can get involved in, and help us. So uh, in order to provide the benefits that Ben was talking about, we first need to find the land to actually put these things on and connect them into the grid. Um, and it's probably due to their small size and connectivity, it's the easiest way anyone can get involved in energy storage because it's essentially a lease agreement. We take all the risk and all the cost with the grid connections and the planning applications. Um, and then we just give you a bit of money for, for the land, essentially. There's no complicated power purchase agreements. And yeah, as I said, all the risk is on us. So next slide. So the benefits to the landowner the rental you will, you will receive for about one and a half car park spaces is a thousand pounds a year index linked 30 years um, or you can choose a upfront 
lump sum of £10,000 for one of payment. Um, and each box will save about 40 tonnes of carbon per year. Um, next slide. So one example with the council we're working with in the early stages, um, North Northamptonshire Council, they have about 1,724 sites in their portfolio. Uh, we've gone through a few of them and I think it's about one in 10 suitability. Um, and this is a number of reasons, uh, the size of the sites and uh, grid. Um, so they have about 180 possible sites. Um, that we can develop battery boxes um, on. And this translates to £180,000 a year or an upfront payment of 1.8 million. And uh, more importantly, saving 7,200 tonnes of carbon um, every year. You just move on. Got some example sites. More, more. <laughs> um, this is Warwick Council. This is just the leisure centre there. Um, the red highlights the second substation, which is where we would need to connect these batteries into. And the green is just an example size of site of the battery box. So we talk about car parking spaces, but they don't need to be um, in the car parking space. They can be on a grass verge that will not be used for anything else apart from this. Um, one more. And then we are also working with a number of water companies. Um, this is an Anglian water site. We've got about 500 sites with them um, right now. Um, this is one of theirs. And the picture on the right is... Um, planning application we will put in so after we've got the grid connection that's all confirmed we will then put in for a planning application and sign the lease and we will start receiving the rent so as i said in theory it is the the easiest way and we can do battery storage that's it, yeah no, oh, thank you, Ashley and Ben. Um, yes, and quite timely. It, please do feel free to put your questions um, in the chat feature. I just wanted to say by myself, you know, I think that the, the session has, as I believe, met the objective, which has really given a number of models of how battery storage um, can be considered by our local authority clients. And um, it might be that you have projects in the pipeline already and something else has, um, you know, interested you. So please do get in touch with Shop Pritchard or our speakers today uh, about particular points. Um, I, I did have one thing, though, if that we haven't got any questions um, submitted yet, but really I'll open it to the floor. But it was really a discussion yesterday that if um, you were to summarise um, the, the next steps for a local authority or any of the listeners today, if this battery storage is something that's not really being contemplated before by an, an authority, what do you think the immediate next steps um, for that authority would be? Um, shall, I, shall I start on that one? I, yeah, sure. I think the, I think the um, it's, an inter it's an interesting question really, isn't it? Local authorities are already looking at a lot of issues in the green agenda. And the first thing is awareness, actually understanding what battery storage is all about and how it works. And not necessarily to the degree that um, Steve maybe went into earlier on, but the, but the broad idea of how it works. And then think, how does that fit with their strategies? Because they've, they've all got climate emergency declarations, they've all got climate change strategies, they've all got action plans. And so harmonising it with what they're already doing, which is where the co-location bit comes in. Well, if you've got a solar farm, shall we put some on? Or if you've got a business, uh, if you've got a building, a council building that's 24 hours, should we put some battery storage on there to keep the lights on the night? That, that sort of thing. Um, so they should be looking for opportunities. And I think that's partly what we're trying to do on this Steve's, the, the Green Steve's thing, isn't it? We're trying to say, look, there's opportunities out there, but you have to you have to be able to spot them and do something about it to actually make something of them. Yeah, Steve, I, th I think that's right. I think step one would be understand the models, which is hopefully what today's session has helped with. And then step two is look for look for the low hanging fruit first. So um, co-location, as Steve said, if you've already got power plants, if you've already got, uh, have you considered battery storage for those? Um, and then projects like the amp, the amp battery box is a really good example of, do you have land? Do you have spare capacity of land that you're just not going to use for anything else? Because one of the amazing things I think about battery box and that Ashley and Ben alluded to is just kind of how small and compact they are and just what spaces they can be used in. And so I think taking that low hanging fruit and then if you want to go to the next level and do the big projects like I was talking about so the frequency response all of those things then you can consider those things so I would I would start with I would start with I would start with the low hanging fruit and then move on from there Thank you, Stephen. We do actually have um, yeah, one question here. Uh, great presentation. So one for Ben, actually. How do you calculate carbon saving? 
Yeah, it's, it's a great question and probably the second question I always get asked. It, 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 is, it is difficult because of the nature of where batteries operate. So the way we got to the 40 tonnes number is we've looked back at the last 12 months and looked at how the battery would operate. But effectively, when there is a high generation, a high amount of wind generation, and it is really wind, not really solar, it's remote wind, the carbon intensity of electricity on the network falls. And you can look at the carbon intensity of electricity at any one moment. It is publicly available on National Grid website. So inevitably, you are likely to charge your battery when it is both cheap and low carbon. And you are more likely to export your electricity when it is expensive and is higher carbon, i.e. those times when demand for electricity is very high. So there's large amounts of gas generation and other fossil fuel generators. So what we've done is we've looked back at how we would have operated the battery in the last 12 months. We've looked at when we, we would charge it, predominantly overnight, sort of two to three, when you have demand is low and proportionally wind is high and carbon intensity is low. And then when we would have discharged it. And crucially, if you discharge a battery, what would you have otherwise had to have turned on in order to provide that power? And the answer at the moment, certainly for the next decade or so, is going to be either gas or coal. That will change in the fullness of time, but that's how we do it. And we're intending to provide a carbon statement to all of our landlords at the end of each year, say, based on the generation that we worked on this year, this is the carbon we've saved based on five sites we have with this council or however it is. But, you know, it's, it's important to try and be transparent about that. Actually, I've got a follow on from that, Radhika, actually, yeah. uh, for Ben. Um, absolutely fascinating. I was going to ask you that as well, because I wasn't quite clear how it had been calculated. But of course, the next question that comes after that then is who gets the offset value? Who gets the carbon value in the contract? Because either it could be you as the as the generator, as the as the uh, developer, if you like, or it could be the council. But as time moves on and we get more voluntary offsetting arrangements coming into place, that carbon actually has a value, doesn't it? Yeah, and, it, and it's interesting. I, I think the answer is probably it will change because at the moment we, we don't think it will be reportable by the council's landlords. But it's interesting also, <laughs> battery technology, and we talk, to talk about, uh, about some in terms of licensing, in terms of carbon, it's actually considered a, con a consumption, consumer of carbon still. Because you're consuming power and you're not getting giving the full um, the full value back for giving back, so the licensing is going to have to catch up to being reportable carbon. So at the moment, I think the the carbon accounting is going to be difficult for the councils to benefit from it. So it's going to be more of a case of here's your income for basically no risk. Here's income, and you can talk in your ESG statements around how you support energy storage. It's going to be difficult, I would say, at this stage for them to say. 40 tonnes off the council's carbon footprint. Well, there isn't, that, of course, there's no legal requirement to, um, uh, as to how you comprise your carbon footprint. So, I mean, a lot of local authorities don't even count scope three at all. Mm. Um, and, and some count some scope three, j just one and two mainly. So it's all voluntary in that sense. So effectively, I, I wrote a guide on on offsetting for local authorities and effectively said you, you can put in it what you like as long as you can justify it. That's the point. If you have some, the, the interesting thing of, of what you've said is you've actually got some data. Others might disagree with that data, but you have actually got some data on which it's calculated. And I think the other important thing, you know, we get we get very caught up in scope one, two and three. Yes, I think there's going to be some complexity around it. But even if you couldn't account for it, I would still say this is a good thing to do for society. It's a good thing. You know, storage is important. There's no doubt about that. The fact you can't necessarily report it tomorrow it doesn't mean it's still not a good thing. I would also, for an R model anyway, you're going to get paid anyway. You don't have any capital risk. You don't have any development risk. You're just going to get paid. And you're doing something that's good for good for society and good for your local networks. So I think, you know, regardless of whether or not you're scope three or, or however you might want to manage it, though I think it's good, it's not a bad outcome. And, and in many respects, people think we're mad because, you know, people are building 50 megawatt batteries in, in one field. We're trying to build 100 megawatts on 500 places, which is, is borderline, borderline, borderline mad. But I, I think fundamentally, it's, it's quite similar to the telecoms industry. I mean, if you walk down the street, how many telecoms towers do you come across? How many times do you come across the gas kiosk? It's being done, it's just never been done in this sector. And we hope that local authorities, water companies are really interested in it, people who want to do their bit and make some risk-free income, effectively, will want to get involved.
No, I mean, I, I, I think it's a great idea, Ben. No, no, no doubt about it. And if, if we do need 50 to 100 gigawatts of battery storage, then there's, there's a big market out there, isn't there? And it doesn't have to be all big sites, standalones or co-location. So it's... Uh, yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. I, I, I think have... it doesn't help low voltage issues. Yeah. That, that's yeah. a fundamental truth. Yeah. Well, that's been brilliant. Uh, thank you for going and explaining that in a bit more detail. Um, I think I'm going to draw the uh, session to a close now and I'll uh, end by saying thank you to our speakers, obviously our regular Steves, um, but also our guest speakers, Ben Wallace and Ashley Boyce um, from Amp Clean Energy. So, but the, the final thing I'll leave you with is the next paper, uh, just a little bit of a plug here. Um, it will be entitled Incorporating Green into Everyday Local Authority Business. So really just an overarching look um, rather than the specific topics that we've covered to date. Um, and we it will be followed with a webinar as per usual. So, yep, that brings me just to say thank you for attending today and goodbye. Take care. Okay.